Hello, everybody, and welcome to the South Carolina Linux Users Group, a combination of Carolina Columbia Linux Users Group and uh, Upstate South Carolina Linux Users Group. Uh, tonight, we've got uh, multiple people giving small presentations, and I really appreciate everyone stepping up and showing us what your Raspberry Pi is doing. Uh, so tonight, we've got Daryl, Andy, Dan, and, and we've got Bobby, who's volunteered, and, and maybe Ben will be able to do some, too. Um, so um, I think uh, if everyone's ready, then Daryl, I'll let you uh, go ahead and start and, and show us what uh, WebMen is. And I think you had some questions even about WebMen. So feel free to uh, mute yourself and, and take it away. Unmute yourself, that is. <laughs> I understood. Um, can everybody hear me okay? I can hear you great. Okay. Um, can you see the rat, see the screen? It's a presentation, Raspberry Pi LAMP server. Yes. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, so my name is Daryl and <clears throat> for the last 20 years, I've had a business working by myself, doing work for, uh, small businesses. And during that time, I've learned to, uh, to create software packages for, for a number of them. Um, recently I'd say in the last few years, I've taught myself PHP and, um, uh, things to build web web applications as opposed to dynamic websites. So uh, like it says, the story behind the whole thing. So I bought this tool to rapidly build uh, web applications. And I, uh, so I'm sitting in a client's office one day working on a computer and the manager for the business, it's a vet, veterinarian's office. So I'm working on the vet's computer and the manager sitting ne next desk over and you hear the phone ring and mm -hmm. she's lamenting that the the employee at the front desk and it's a small area where she's at um is trying to deal with somebody calling in wanting to make an appointment she's got people checking in you know coming in with their animals for, for their appointment she's got people trying to check out take their money and all that stuff and she'd love to be able to help her at least with the people calling in for getting appointments but they have a custom software package that runs the vet practice and it has the ability to schedule appointments in it, but it's not something they felt, uh, they just didn't want to deal with it. So they, what they actually have is a paper book, an actual, that they have to, uh, choose. so she would have had to get up from her desk, go up to the front, which is already crowded anyway, and look through the book, you know, and trying to find, you know, uh, I think there's only one telephone up there, so you know it's a it's a big ordeal thing so i'm sitting there and i'm thinking and i thought well what if i if you had something that you could you know work from your desk she said, what are you talking about so um i think i'm thinking the whole time about i can create an app you know and uh, so this is if you actually go to that url there the adsi-sc.com slash clinic slash index.php that's live you can look at it uh, while you know during the presentation if you want to if i can get over there can you uh copy that into the chat please well it's on the screen there true uh but it's uh, hard to cut and paste from there but thank you okay well it's Give me just a second. There you go. All right. So click send, Daryl. All right. The, the little um Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not sure what you guys see right now. Do you see a screen with, uh, it says, uh, uh, the VICT uh, clinic and has a sign, has a login prompt. Right. So this is what I developed. It took me less than an hour to build this thing. 
with that tool. And uh, so I'm sitting there talking to her about it. You know, I said, you know, what if I built you something? You know, it's it's like a it's gonna be like on a little web server, and you don't have to install it on any of your computers. You just you can use it. She said, another computer. We don't have room for another computer. So then I thought, hmm, I've heard you guys talk about these little uh, uh, ras Raspberry Pis. I never have messed with one. I thought, well, maybe I can do it on that. I'm sure you probably could. And uh, and I said, well, I could put it in the cloud. She said, I know, you know, I, and she wasn't happy with that. I can tell you from years of dealing with small businesses, they're not real keen on having their data hanging out in Hackerville. And uh, so I said, okay, well, then you know, back to the Raspberry Pi thing. So this is where we're going with this. And uh, let me go back to this. So there you can log in, you know, the username is staff, the password's ABC123, all lowercase. And if you'll go over to the on the calendar to January of this year, and I'll switch back. I'll go ahead and log in. let me <laughs> Daryl uh, is that login screen something you developed in PHP that was a tool that built all of this you know I didn't I did write some code more or less to turn off some of the features it has but uh, like I said this was written in less than two minutes to uh, less okay. than an hour all right. Yeah. And, uh, try lo try logging in again. I was logged in thinking you were uh, suggesting instructions to follow. I'm sorry. I didn't understand what you I said. may have blocked you by having been logged in thinking no, that you were I'm, giving us instructions to follow. No, no, I'm logged in. Um, and you can see from the calendar, it's a really nice deal. I think uh, real quick. You know, they got a calendar. They don't have to use that. They can come up and go to the appointments. And I'm not going to make a presentation about this. But one of the cool things I like about it is that sometimes the doctor wants to know when she's got that patient's for surgery. And if you just type SUR and do a search, it will filter it down to just those appointments that she could see. You know, so it's, it's great. It's a nice app. Okay, enough of that. Let's go back. So you know the story behind it. So there's the app. She could I put that in the cloud just for her to look at, see if that's what she wanted. We never really got around to discussing it. But uh, over the years, I have played with the idea of, of uh, creating a software package and selling it. And I've, I, I've been on the other end of that, people buying packages and me having to install it on their servers, install it on their workstations. And it's just a nightmare. And from the other side of it, trying to support that it would be ludicrous. And I was thinking it would be nice if you had a little computer that, or an appliance that you could load everything on, you know, put it in a box, ship it to them. They plug it into their network and they're ready to go to work. Didn't have to get in. So this Raspberry Pi seems like the ideal thing for that. And so this is the hardware I went out and bought. I bought, the, I got two of the 64 gig micro SD cards. The, I uh, ended up with a Raspberry Pi 4B eight gigabytes and in case you don't know they're extremely hard to come by right now the retail is 75 dollars i had to pay the other side of 150 bucks to get this one um one of the things that really is cool is this geek worm is naspi the little box it comes in a kit and i'll show you some pictures of it in a second and then uh, i happen to have a, a 120 gig solid state hard drive lying around so i use that to actually work with my monitor, I didn't want to dis dismantle my monitor here in my work at my workstation in my office just to program this thing. So I had a little 17 inch VGA monitor. Um, so I went and bought a uh, standard VGA cable. It actually was a standard DC HDMI to VGA cable, and then I had to go from the standard HDMI to the micro HDMI to plug into the, the uh, Raspberry Pi. And of course, I had to buy a couple of readers to read the little S micro SD cards. 
and this is what it all looks like. Uh, there's some multiple pictures. The one on the left at the box, that's the top of the box. It has a cooling fan in it. And it's here you can see the bottom part of it, the S the uh, solid state hard drive mounts down there. And the way they actually, shall we say, cable the solid state hard drive to the actual Raspberry Pi is through that little block right there. It plugs into two of those uh, USB ports. I um, I bought those things. I bought that kit off of Amazon. It was about a, about fifty nine dollars. That was very reasonable in my opinion. The quality is excellent. Okay, so you you know the next thing is, and again, I've never messed with one of these things, so I had to go hunt down all this stuff. Uh, I happen to run my workstations in my office run Linux Mint, so I was able to install the Raspberry Pi imager on it. And Jace, I know you were trying, I think you installed the, the desktop version of Raspberry Pi OS on yours, was wondering how to add stuff to it. I did that originally and didn't see any, it didn't see, it wasn't going to work. So I went back and used this OS Lite, which is pretty much like a server edition and was able to do that and then <clears throat> there's a that kit i bought there's a cool the cooling to get it to work you have to download a script and run that in order to turn the cooling fan on uh, i installed apache 2 php maria db php my admin webmin and bsftpd the last one was a nightmare to get to work um so jace was asking me all the things i went through i put you know i'm not a uh i don't get to i'm not a guy that takes linux and lifts the hood and it's got to mess with everything so a lot of this stuff i had to write down so i'd remember how to do it later so i've got several pages of commands that, and I, I just went through a bunch of um presentations people had put up out on the web learn how to do this install this stuff um, but I had heard over the years you guys talking about webmin I had never messed with it so I in, wanted to install that because I thought it would make it uh, easier to manage this thing and it is that's what leads us to the questions about webmin what I have been able to work with it with this Raspberry Pi, for example, uh, if I want to SSH into this thing, it'll come back. I know it won't. It says that you know there's no server. But when I got into Webman, you can go to servers, PHP, or SSH server, and start it from there. If we won't do that. Anyway, let's see if I can get in again. No, that looks right. That's your first time connecting to it, right? Sure, you want to continue? To, yes. So you say yes. No, I've actually. You have to type yes. You have to type the whole word. Yeah. There you go. Actually, that's the first time I've seen that come up. It's a thousand times I've done this. There you go. You know, so now you're in. And there's a lot of other things with this um, webmin that I really have used. It's like the file manager. When I was trying to. Um, you know, FTP the files for this app onto this thing. Uh, that took a long time to figure out how to get that to work. This is the actual same application that's in the cloud. 
is on this Raspberry Pi. I'll log into it. Maybe not. So it's the same thing and it's you know, really quick. So it kind of seems like to me the ideal item or I guess uh, the ideal solution to what I wanted to do, which was uh, be able to create something, load it on a piece of hardware and ship it to somebody. That's the uh, URL to get into WebMan. It's on port 10,000. And that's the command to get into SSH. That's the first time I've ever done that, used SSH. But once I got into it, I was using the heck out of it. But anyway, that's what I have done. Now, <clears throat> you know, it took me a while to figure out that solid state hard drive is just sitting out, hanging out there doing nothing. But they have the newest version of that Raspberry Imager Raspberry Pi Imager has the ability to take, I can take the SD card that's in it now and image that to that solid state hard drive using that uh, imager. That's the next thing I'd like to try. But uh, one of the questions I got is uh, would having, having it run from a solid state hard drive is a better deal than having it to run from a SD card? Anybody got any thoughts on that? You should see a little bit of improvement. I don't believe the, uh, well, you're running a fan, and if you're running a fan, you can overclock the Raspberry Pi, and therefore you might be able to take advantage of the solid state drive speed. Uh, but normally the um, SD, running off an SD, would be slow, except that, of course, Raspberry Pi is slow to begin with, so you don't notice it. I'm not so worried about uh, speed. My biggest concern is reliability. You don't want to lose somebody's data or have the piece of equipment go down right in the middle of their work day. And I don't know how reliable a micro SD card is compared to a solid state hard drive. A solid state hard drive ought to be more reliable over a long period of time. SSD, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the uh, standard is still uh, two years. Um, before uh, it starts evaporating. In other words, the memory is not intended to uh, last longer than uh, two years on it. They're temporary storage. Uh, unless you get the archivals, which are the same form factor, but I don't think they ever sold those in eight gigs. Yeah. Anyway. Now, I, I, now help me help me out. I think I'd heard recently, but it, it used to be that you could only boot from the SD card. Has that been changed? Yes, that you it could? has. It okay. has. With the latest versions of it, you could if if there's not an SSD a micro SD card present, mm -hmm. it will attempt to boot from the SSD. I see. Okay. Right. Yes. Well, now one other thing I was wondering is maybe if in Webmin you could just mount your um, SSD and, and keep it as a mount point and and continue to boot off the SD card. I mean, you know, you, you do what you want, you know, um, you probably want to make that a long term anyway, uh, but <clears throat> I'm just well, under hardware, maybe. I don't know. Let's see. Well, I don't that's know. I what I have. I'm under Webman, but that's what I have been doing is I mount my hard drive uh, and under with an e um, from an FS tab boot from the micro SD, but uh, keep most of the stuff on a hard drive. Um, SCSI device A. What, what size was that? This? That What's would be that? right, about 120 gigs. Yeah. So you can do what? Uh, I haven't used this before, but I, I'm guessing you probably could be able to mount it somehow, create a partition and mount the partition or something. Like white partition. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you want us to destroy it during this meeting? Yeah, he's going to say you better, <laughs> better research it, Daryl, because you'll destroy your drive. You're not careful. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be a good topic for another uh, uh, exactly. month. Exactly. That's why, you know, 
but uh, man, I, you know, it's, that's the tool I, I would absolutely put on a device that I were going to give a customer to use, not for them, but you know, for me to use later if I needed to do something remotely. Well, Daryl, I'll tell you, the Webmin is a, is a tool that certainly helps people that you know are afraid to get into the terminal too, you know, and is want something that's a GUI interface to do a lot of stuff that you can do from the terminal. Or just uh, do it I, quickly, right? Yeah, but were you aware that there's also another tool, it's a sister tool of Webmin called Usermin that allows there's, you to, to uh, administer your groups and your users? Yeah, there's several of them out there. Yeah. I, just, I think this was probably the original one. Uh, no, Usermin and Webmin are separate. No, Webmin I, I probably heard about Webmin about 20 years ago. Same right, time. right. So it's just been around a long time, but yeah, it's something user men is just for groups and users. Yeah, I know there were other ones. Some people use cPanel, you know, but uh, another tool is Cockpit. Yeah. Well, I guess that's all I got, Jace. Well, that's thanks, Daryl. That was that's really cool. I, I you know. I, like you say, we've been talking about Webmin for years. I myself have never used it, and so I'm glad to, fi to finally see it, you know, <laughs> yeah. and to see all the things that it can do. And uh, that's that's really cool. The uh, the case and all that stuff that you got for uh, for your customer there. Um, so yeah. Um, all right. So I got uh, next on uh, the docket here is uh, Andy. Are you uh, Andy? Are you there? You have to can unmute you yourself. Me? Can you hear me? Hey, Andy, there you are. How's, how's the volume? I didn't adjust it or anything. Sounds good to me. All right. <clears throat> Let me see if I can share this. Share my screen. Let me see. Oh, there we go. All see, right. Gary, so, <laughs> oh, the uh, <clears throat> infinite mirrors or whatever. Yeah, we were we were questioning that before the meeting. <laughs> no, it's gonna happen regardless. So this is the uh, so my my Raspberry Pi, at least the one that's running, <laughs> is uh, currently running plane tracking software and a uh, weather station software. So this is the live map, and you can see like what six planes there's not a lot flying also my antenna is not optimally located so i don't get to see everything but part of the bonus and this is put out by a company called flight aware so it's an actual it's just the image i imaged the raspberry pi but it's it's debian um based so it's, it's just raspberry pi os so you can go and add stuff to it so i went and installed the weather station software on top of it and then there are half a dozen different services that track planes. And so I have all their software installed as well. And um, the nice thing is when you feed your data to these services, they give you a premium or enterprise or business level account. And so uh, you get to, to see more from them. So like, if I went over here to the one of the sites, Flight Radar 24, and then this is the same. <laughs> Let me zoom in on GSP here a little bit more. But um, so there's GSP in the middle, and eh, there's not that many, too many planes flying around just because it's the time of day. <clears throat> but hey, um, Andy, but, yeah. For purposes of the recording, is there any way you can magnify that so that we can we can because it's very tiny for me, and I got a big monitor. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, how's this? Ooh, oh, there we go. Better. This, ah, I'm not sure about the icons. I think the eye. But anyway, um, let me go zoom in here on. How does it track it, Andy? Is it tracked by squawk <clears throat> number? So, yeah. So, what it is, is um, there's a technology called ADSB that's installed on all the aircraft, and they broadcast on uh, 1090 megahertz. And uh, it's it's just open air, and so I have. Let me switch over real quick. So here's the here's what it looks like in my kitchen. <laughs> so there's the weather station USB display up there, and then in the box, 
is the Raspberry Pi. And this is the dongle. And then there's the antenna. It's just sitting in the in the house. Actually, let me let me get there's a better picture here of the box. <clears throat> so yeah, it's just a little USB dongle that listens in and uh it, it's a software defined radio. So it's just one of the, like RTL SDR dongles, but this one's put out by Fly to Wear itself. Uh, I want to say it was like 20 bucks on Amazon and then the antenna was another 20 bucks. I probably have less than 50 bucks in additional gear. Uh, and then the rest of this is my some of my home security cameras. <laughs> but um, and then the uh, the weather station itself is out in the backyard. And it's just a little Accurite hundred dollar thing from I don't even think it's hundred dollars anymore from um, I got mine from Costco or Sam's. I can't remember at this point. But um, but it wirelessly wirelessly talks back to the uh, the little USB this this little display which has USB as well, and then I have some software called WeWX. It's Python based that uh, frees the USB data and uh, actually uploads it to Weather Underground, so uh, so I contribute there as well. But um, but yet yeah, to go back to the flight tracking yeah it's adsb it's broadcast and so for example i can click on this plane here and see now the information's coming off of it it'll be like the speed and the altitude sorry let me uh there we go oh <laughs> hopefully that's better for the recording but um but yeah, this is all the information coming off of the antenna and the dongle. And then um, it goes back to FlightAware. FlightAware will look up the, the hex code and then give you the more of identifying information. And then if I click on this link, it should pop up on FlightAware's actual website and give me some information about the flight and the plane and such. Um, so like there's flight aware, there's flight radar 24, uh, there's one called open ADSB exchange. And that one is, um, completely open. They share and archive all their data for research purposes. And so, yeah, you can pick up, especially here with Donaldson, you pick up the, uh, the military helicopters and the, the planes coming in and doing their uh, maintenance work. So they come loop around almost in a whole bunch or uh, we'll get Navy uh, Poseidon planes that are uh, there. They're the electronics jets for radar and surveillance and, and jamming and stuff. And they'll come up for Jacksonville and do loops around GSP and uh, you can get some cool pictures. And then there's a, uh, several 747s that come into gsp for cargo so actually that's one of them that i uh the oop, the picture i got was uh, ooh, over here and this was actually me running outside onto my back porch and pointing the camera straight up <laughs> as it was coming over so <laughs> that was uh that was pretty fun because I was a flight like, path there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They hang around and uh, come in. When they're coming in from the south, they loop around Simpsonville. And when they're coming in from the north, they don't. And I don't get any pictures. But um, and then there's a group of people on Facebook who spot planes for GSP. So I we go on there and tell each other when things are coming in. But. Um, but yeah, that's really what it is. Um, let me. There's not too much to it. Like I said, I installed. I started with the Pyware image, and um, and you know went from there. So yeah, he's flying. He's on the I'm trying to look see if there's anything low altitude. Probably not. Probably not on mine because my antenna does better at the high altitude planes. I need to get a newer antenna. And actually, one of the services just sent me a, an antenna with, there's there's another frequency, nine, 978 megahertz for the general aviation flights. That's 
apparently they're trying to expand their coverage. And so they're like, would you like us to send you an antenna and a dongle for that? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so it just came in the mail last week. I haven't had the chance to, to hook it up. Membership has but, its privileges. Yeah. So, okay. um, but yeah, so the weather station software, this is the actual, let me refresh it. Cause I literally got it working this afternoon. So the graphs aren't going to be too spectacular, but, um, but this is all the information from my actual weather station right here. And then um, there's a lot more. Uh, this is a lot more details than what gets sent up to, uh, to Weather Underground. But if I go over to the Weather Underground tab, hopefully it'll... Andy, is that set up through Node Red server? Or how did you set that up with the weather? So this is actually... Um, so the software is called WeWX, oh, and okay. it is just generating HTML files. Oh, okay. So it's just throwing files down in the far WW HTML WeWX, and so. I was going to say I, I, I it looks familiar because I I used to run a Node Red server on a Raspberry Pi, and uh, Node Red you can do a tremendous amount of stuff. Yeah, I do not know how the internal workings are. Uh, it was more of a piece of software that would run on Linux and was free and would work with my, yep. <laughs> with my weather station <laughs> software. The, the neat thing, I mean, it's fun to watch, especially like when we get the occasional heavy storms, you just watch the wind speed shoot up. But um, unfortunately it, it only reports like every 15 seconds for the wind speed, which is really, you know, the wind can change a lot in 15 seconds, but um I uh, yeah, I just haven't invested in better hardware. So that's really that's really it. Which with what this Raspberry Pi does, my I had a different one that uh, unfortunately died. So to the point of um, discussing SD cards versus SSDs earlier, uh, SD cards are not very tolerant of power outages. Um, I've had bad bad runs with that um so if you're if you're concerned either put it on a little battery backup or make sure you you take a backup um because i've this is actually same raspberry pi but this is the second or third sd card i'm on because i had a a, a bad power outage and it just didn't boot back up so but it was relatively easy to rebuild so that's not yeah you know, i i keep fairly good notes on how I set it up. It's pretty remarkable setup you got here. Yeah, I was going to say that's really cool stuff. <laughs> I'm, well, I'm really like impressed. I said, this is all, yeah, this is all the, the software. I mean, I I put it all together. I put it together, but I didn't, you know, I didn't write any of it. So <clears throat> I used to have it rsync up to uh to my personal domain so that way I could see it without being connected. But then since then I've gotten wired, so I really don't need to to worry about it. Plus when it works, it talks to weather underground and I can go see see my weather and then all my apps on my phone talk to get everything together. So it's kind of a nice aggregation of everything. But um but yeah, yeah and, and um the weather station software uses SQLite database. Um, the flight tracking one uses JSON files. So I haven't uh, haven't done any real real hacking of anything or not try or, or I guess extracurricular data mining myself yet. <laughs> I do want to kind of figure out if I can start like alerting myself to certain planes coming in, but I I haven't gotten there yet. And with the military planes, they'll uh, They'll turn their transponders off sometimes. <laughs> yeah, Andy, what I was doing with Node Red too, I was tracking uh, earthquakes around the world with it. Earthquake activity. Uh, it was pretty remarkable what you could do with that. Uh, it actually logged all of the earthquakes above a certain magnitude, like magnitude four and higher, or magnitude six and higher, and uh, worldwide. Where, where was it pulling its data from? Like USGS? Or? Yes, USGS. Hmm. 
Okay. Yeah, didn't we? We not we. I say we, but South Carolina. Didn't South Carolina have another earthquake this week? This past, I think another. There was another one. There's been several in, like, near Columbia, over the past like month, few months. It's kind you know, of unusual funny. for the for the mountains here. It, it's funny. On Wednesday, I felt like th- uh, there was a little bit of wobble when I was at church Wednesday night. So I wonder if it, was it Wednesday, maybe. Anyway. I don't know. I don't. I, don't know. I usually go, like I said, I go to earthquakes.us or, or either either earthquake or earthquakes.usgs.gov. Probably both work. Actually, here. Let's. let's Are they doing bit. any fracking around Columbia these days? <laughs> Unaware. Yeah, that's. I think it's earthquakes.usgs.com or .org. There. Or .gov, maybe. I, I can't remember if it's a government site or not. It's been a while since I was working with it. No. No. Apparently not considered significant. Well, I'll tell you what, Andy, those are, pr- those are pretty anyway. cool. The, uh, the, the plane tracking and the, the weather, that's, that's pretty cool stuff. I appreciate yeah. you uh, sh- showing up today no, and showing us. No, all- no, no problem. Yeah. I'm, Thank you. I'm glad I could finally show something for once. <laughs> I think I want- so I guess, uh, Dan, since you were, you were um, here a second ago, you want to yeah. take over from now? Yeah. Let me go ahead and uh, see. Ha- Andy has to unshare, I believe, before I can. Yeah. I, 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 Andy, I'm, I'm assuming you are finished. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was very, okay. very informal. So. <laughs> well, that's what this whole night is. <laughs> Let me go ahead and start sharing mine. And uh, these guys are putting me to shame because I didn't prepare any slides or anything. Uh, Daryl's uh, the one that prepared. <laughs> yeah. 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 Daryl has that. He's so far. He has. Yep. The, Mine's Thanks all again. just off the cuff here. I'm not sharing. I mean, I'm not doing any kind of presentation or anything um, oh, in God. slides or format. Anyway, um, okay, so I've got two Raspberry Pi. Can everybody see my screen, by the way? Yes. How uh, to yes. set up your own yeah. domain website. Okay. The first thing I want to talk about is my blog. And you're looking at my blog right now. Uh, you're looking at one of the articles I wrote a while back, um, May the 15th of 2020, by the way under the name of Data Pioneer, which is my uh, nom de plume. And that used to be the look of my website, but I'll show you what it looks like now. Anyway, uh, I have two Raspberry Pis. I have a Raspberry Pi model 3B plus, one gigabyte, and that's what this is running on. It has a 128 gigabyte micro SD card. It's using the full card uh, to store all the files. And I've got like a... On this website, I have uh, approximately 120 or 130 articles right now uh, that I've done with a bunch of uh, media files in the library. So I need a lot of space. Um, And then the second Raspberry Pi that I'll talk about here in a moment is a Raspberry Pi Model 4, uh, four gigabyte version, which is running my network attached storage system. Okay, so back to the 3B plus, uh, what I did basically, and you're looking at what it basically looks like here back then, I've been running uh, a website called datapioneer-network.org. And what I'll do is I will, after this presentation before tomorrow sometime, uh, everything I talk about tonight, I will post upon uh, the group links and everything to what I've talked about so that we don't have to go and put it in the text. Um but anyway, I've been running this website now for approximately three years, nonstop. The only time that the website is offline is when I do maintenance on it or when I do a backup. And I back up, when I do a backup, I do a backup of the entire micro SD card. So I'm having to back up a 128 gigabyte micro SD card using DD to do it. 
and it takes about two hours. So I do it at uh, late late at night when nobody's on the site, and most people don't even know about it. So what I did basically, uh, what you'll need to do this is you'll need broad, obviously a broadband service. Um, I went out and captured my domain, bought my domain through Google Domains for $12 um, called datapioneer-network.org, set up the DNS for it. I registered my website through ICANN, which you were required to do by law. And, um, and so that it's also fully registered. So it's a legal website. It is self-hosted, however. I don't have any company doing it for me and not doing any kind of uh, work for me. So I, I did all the heavy lifting myself to set this up. Um, I connected uh, everything through my, uh, my router, which is uh, wired, connected to the Raspberry Pi. And then I installed... Um, on the card itself, I installed Raspberry, I believe on the original, it was Raspbian OS, which is based on Debian Buster. For the NAS, I'm using Raspberry Pi OS, which is based on Debian uh, Bullseye. So for this particular website, I installed Apache 2, I installed PHP, I installed uh, MySQL server and a MySQL client on the Raspberry Pi. Um, at the time hey, I set this up, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, but but something was a question for me. So there's a difference between Raspbian and Raspberry Pi OS? Yeah, yes, there is. Raspbian oh. OS is uh, the earlier version for the Pi yeah. Raspberry Pi, which is based on Debian Buster, which is Debian 10. Right. And then now uh, if you go through and use the uh, RPI installer that I think Daryl mentioned, you can pull down what's called Raspberry Pi OS, which is based on Debian 11, which is Bullseye. Oh, I was not aware of this. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. No problem. Okay, so at the time I put this the website together, I was still using Windows 10 for a lot of things. And so I used Mobile Xterm, but I don't do that anymore. Uh, I use SSH only through Linux. And so um, I set up the SSH server as well. Uh, enabled it and activated it and set up the keys for it. Um, and then I also installed SFFTP client uh, as well for that uh, in case I needed to get into it without having to connect a keyboard mouse and, uh, uh, and a, you know, a terminal screen. So, uh, it talks about how to get into the pie and everything else. Uh, what I, I won't going to go into a lot of the detail here because I'm going to put a link to the website in my uh, group message tomorrow so that you can read about all this yourself. I wasn't going to go into a lot of the detail because it could take a long time to really get into the detail of it. Um, but I will tell you that, um, like I said, I've been running this. Um, oh, after I set all that up and got it up and running, I had to, the hardest part for me was was putting the, uh, well, what I did was I installed WordPress because that's my white site is a WordPress website. And so what I did was I, um, after I got WordPress set up, then I had to connect the PHP functionality to the WordPress website. And so it was a matter of running the right commands and everything, which the, uh, uh, website goes into the, the, the article here goes into how to connect up your uh, um, PHP to it so that it uses PHP because as most people know WordPress and if you don't know WordPress is a content management system CMS which means it is a um, an active not a static website and so it uses uh, MySQL a database for a lot of this functionality and PHP is a major player in that. If you don't have that connected up properly, what you'll get when you access the website is you'll get something that says uh, uh, PHP uh, is or database is disconnected and you'll not, it won't work. So you have to make sure you do it properly. That, 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 that's another, another evening to talk about that. It's a whole involved process. Um, but after I set up the uh, website and got it working properly and everything, was able to get into it, administer it through the WordPress uh, 
admin interface and everything. Uh, I was concerned that the website needed to be um, SSL secured. And you'll notice here that there's an icon here, which means that this website is a secure website uh, secured by SSL. And the reason for that is not just because I wanted it to be secure, but because people who visit websites today are not going to stay on your website or they're not going to register an account on your website or anything like that if they see that it's not secure. And why is that? Because they're concerned about their privacy and their data. So it must be a secure website. And to do that, I used something called Let's Encrypt. And so there's a process here. This article on my blog tells you how to install Let's Encrypt SSL certificate for a self-hosted WordPress website using Secure Shell. So I'm not gonna get into a lot of the detail here tonight about that either, because you can go up and read everything to your heart's content uh, about that here, okay? I will tell you that what I've done too is since I am not a business, I am a resident user of Spectrum Internet, uh, technically and legally, I could probably run a self-hosted website However, if it starts to bog down uh, bandwidth at Spectrum and they notice it, um, they might contact me and say, you need to cease and desist your uh, website that's self-hosted or we'll terminate your service. Well, they have never done that in three years. So I'm obviously not doing that now. Does that mean I'm not getting a lot of visitors? Absolutely not. I mean, at one point on my website, DP Network, I had 981 people accessing my website simultaneously. So I've got a lot of people looking at my website. And if you Google uh, things about associated with my website, it'll pull it up on the first page. So I've got SEO running for this. But what I was gonna say is, is with Less Encrypt SSL, it's uh, a uh, fully uh, capable SSL certificate, not self-signed, signed by Less Encrypt. And uh, so it's a legal SSL certificate that gives you a legitimate secure uh, SSL, secure uh, socket layer encryption. But it, all, it updates itself every 90 days. It has to be re-updated every 90 days. So what I did was I ran a program that I discovered uh, in Linux. And I can't remember the name of it. For some reason, it has escaped me. But what that does is it watches my router and uh, from the Raspberry Pi, and it looks to see if the uh, website WAN address, rather, has changed or if the website SSL certificate is approaching its expiration date. And when it approaches the expiration date, it goes out and updates it automatically for me. And, is it certified by any chance? I'm sorry? Is it certified by any chance? Certbot. C E R T B O T. Yes, sir. You've got it. That's exactly it. Certbot does this for me automatically every 90 days. I don't have to touch it. And I can tell you that in three years, I've never updated this website for SSL. Certbot has done it for me automatically. Um, and so I have also a DDNS running on my router through asuscom.com, which is uh, supported by my router, which is an Asus router. And it looks at the WAN IP address, which is the IP provided by my uh, ISP. And if my ISP's WAN address ever changes, uh, asuscom.com will automatically, within a matter of probably 15 seconds to a minute at most, will automatically switch over and pick up the new IP address. And my website will be back up and running without being dropped. Otherwise, this would drop if my WAN changed because it looks at the WAN address, obviously, on the DNS side where I've uh, configured it for my domain itself, okay? Here's what the website looks like itself. Uh, you can see how responsive it is. Responsive it is. Um, that was really quick. And if you go to a, an article, it's my latest article is on the friend operating system, which is probably something that I want to uh, eventually talk about here at a future time. It's an open source cloud-based operating system for everybody. If I click on that link, it will take you out to that article itself, which is running on my website. 
Okay, so this is my website here running. Um, I have built into my website uh, Tech and World Local News RSS feed. And if you click on that, it takes you to this page to tell you a little bit about it. And if I click on this icon right there, it'll take you to the RSS feed aggregator called Fresh RSS. This is running on my second R uh, Raspberry Pi as a Docker container uh, running in Portainer. Uh, I was going to talk about that a little later, but I, I may put that on a different night. But uh, this is one of the uh, things that is running on that. Okay. Okay, so um, let me go back to here. And um, trying to think if there's anything else that I need. I think this is pretty much it. But it's a website that's dedicated to technology education. And like I said, I've got probably 130 articles or more, uh, all education-based, running on this website, which is self-hosted, running on my Raspberry Pi 3B Plus with one gig of RAM. And you can see how responsive it is. All right, so that's the, the blog. All right, so now I want to talk about the second Raspberry Pi I have, which is a four, model four, four gig. And uh, one of the pages is that is, uh, it's a different uh, IP address, obviously. The IP address for my blog is 192.168.1.90. Uh, the IP address for my Raspberry Pi model four is 192.168.1.125. Both of them are class C IP addresses. This particular page is being pulled up uh, on that Raspberry Pi. You can see that it is at, and this is not secure, okay? So whereas the blog is secure, the Raspberry Pi Model 4B is not. And it, it's not because I don't really need it to be. Um, it is running at that address, IP address, at that port number, 8181. So what you're looking at here is an index of applications that are running on my Raspberry Pi through an application called Portainer, which is right here. Um, but the actual network attached storage that I'm gonna talk about tonight, that's also running on this Raspberry Pi, is running over something called Open Media Vault. And let me click on that. Now, Open Media Vault is an application that uh, has to be installed on the Raspberry Pi after you get the operating system up and running, which is Raspberry Pi OS. And I'm gonna go ahead and log into it and show you, oh, it's actually gonna have to go into RoboForm and put in my password. That master password needs to be up and running. All right, and let me go back and let me go to Open Media Vault. Okay. Okay, so this is Open Media Vault. And this is what allows me to take two one terabyte Western Digital Black um, drives that are sitting in a dual bay enclosure out on uh, above my actual workstation, actually. And, and also a four terabyte SSD to combine those together to create a six terabyte NAS that I'm running off the second Raspberry Pi. But Open Media Vault is doing the uh, bringing them all together. Now, when I say bringing them all together, it's not bringing them all together in a raid because unfortunately, Open Media Vault does not trust USB connectivity to set up a RAID, even though the functionality is built into the operating, into the open source software. This is open source software, it's called Open Media Vault. It is um, set up, uh, let me go about it real quick, let me go out here. This is the article on my blog, which is why I'm not going to show you a lot of stuff about how, how to do it. This article here, and I'll put all these links out in the group, is called Setting Up a NAS on a Raspberry Pi 3B Plus. So, if you want to learn how to do that, you can read this article. And then in this article, when I set this article up and set up my Raspberry Pi uh, 4 for the NAS, uh, I was uh, 
I was uh, using a different approach because it was an earlier version of Open Media Vault, which I've now updated to the latest version. And but I haven't updated my article. All right. So there's a blog. Here's a link rather to another channel uh, provider creator called DB Tech. If you click on that, that'll take you out to DB Tech's blog. And from that, it'll take you to his YouTube channel video that shows you how to set it up with the latest version. And the reason that you need to do that is because when I set up the Open Media Vault initially, you set that up via a uh, file, uh, an installer. Now you have to set it up through a script. And so DB Tech gets into the script that you have to run to set that up. All right, so uh, let's go back to Open Media Vault. And so this is it right here. And this is the latest version. And what you do basically is if you go up here to um, disks, you'll see the disks that are actually out there. Um, here's the vendor. Here are the two 931.5, one gigabyte or one terabyte, if you will, drives. Let me pull this out a little bit. And this is the two Western Digital drives, okay? And they're one terabyte each. And then here is the, uh, this is the Kingston drive that I have hanging out on the Raspberry Pi, which is a 250 gigabyte. But I also have a 3.64 or potentially a four terabyte um, called BUP backup, which is an SSD drive, which is four terabytes in size. And so what I do is I have this drive, this drive, and this drive making up the total four, five, six terabytes but there are three separate drives, all right? So SMB CIFS shares and shared folders that I have out there on the web or out there on my LAN rather, um, will only allow you to access shares associated with these three drives. It won't put them together all as one drive. So you don't see six terabytes total storage. The reason I say that is if you go down to the shared folders, let me uh, scroll down the page here to the shared folders. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. And click on that. Is everybody still there? I heard some noise, sound like somebody came in or out or something. Yeah, I think someone joined. Okay, okay. all right, so here we go. Here are all of the uh, shared folders that I have set up. I have one called NAS one terabyte green, NAS one terabyte black. I have one called Linux store, one called ISO repo, which are all my ISO files. I have one called data and I have one called Acer store. All right, and then from here, fairly complicated setup, but SMB CIFS. So this is set up for interfacing with a Windows system as well. So this is a simple message block, common internet file system. And uh, if you go out to the shares themselves and click it, here are all the shares that I have set up. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and one of them is called Linux Store, okay, which is uh, using, I believe, the, uh, the, the four terabyte SSD. Can everybody see that screen right there? Has it changed? I can see a dandelion. Right. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up File Manager. I'm running this in Farron OS, by the way. This is File Manager in Farron OS. I'm going to go out on the network. This is on my LAN. And you can see here that uh, it says Raspberry Pi SMB CIFS. So double click it. I've already logged into it, so I don't need to log into it again. Here's the Linux store. If I double click it, there is a security on it, so I need to say I'm a registered user. I'm going to put in my password and connect to it. There I am. So here are all of the folders and files that are residing in that share uh, being run by Open Media Vault as a network attached storage share. Okay. If I wanted to connect to something else, I can hit network again. I can do the double click on that. And if I wanted to go out to my, let's say my ISO repo 
folder. Double click that, and it opens it right up. And the reason for that is I've got this set up, it'd be accessible by anybody that can access my land. All right, so this is how I've got it set up. Everything that's being run here is being run by the network attached storage solution called Open Media Vault. And the latest version of that, by the way, is I think 5.6, if I'm not mistaken, that I'm running anyway. Uh, let's see, let's go to one more. Um, if I go to Western Digital Black Drive, and there's all the stuff that I've got residing on that drive. So I can access six terabytes of available storage space uh, across my LAN from any device connected to my LAN. So I can do it from... Live streaming is on. Okay, so I hope we, hopefully we're back. But anyway, I, I don't have a lot more to cover anyway um, from that angle. This is all the uh, things that I can touch basically through my network attached storage which is a total, grand total of about six terabytes of data that I can touch there. Let me go back to my, uh, what I was doing here. And this is all through Open Media Vault. And uh, so let me go ahead and get out of that. I'm gonna log out of it. Anybody have any questions before I get out of it? Okay, all of the functionality here, I've got several servers running on it. I got an SSH server running on it. Uh, rsync server, FTP server, many servers that are running on just this one open source software package. Let me go ahead and log out of it and say yes. If this thing never gets turned off. It runs three six. It runs uh, twenty four seven, three sixty five. Okay. Um, the only other thing I wanted to show you is real quick is Heimdall, which is the index that I was telling you about. Um, this is the guy, Portainer, that controls all of that. And so if I log into Portainer, here you're looking at Portainer, and you're, let me go down to Stacks, and let me go up to eight stacks here. And so here are all of the containers that are currently running in Portainer out on my network attached storage uh, Raspberry Pi Model 4. This is also running on the Model 4 at the same time that uh, that uh, Open Media Vault is running. And so what I did was to create these, was I installed Portainer, and then I went out and grabbed Linux Docker images, set them up as stacks, and then deployed the stacks. And so for instance, the fresh RSS that you saw, if I click on that, and then I click on the editor, here's the image that I pulled down from the Linux IO, .io Docker images. And then, of course, I have to modify those uh, the stack to correspond to my setup, which means I have to change the PUID, the GPI, PGID, the time zone, and this uh, volume right here. Okay, and uh, I won't go into the description of how I did that, but once I do, I do that, then I come down and uh, I tell it to update the stack, which will initially deploy the stack. And when I deploy the stack, it turns into the container that you saw earlier uh, in uh, Open Media Vault. So let me go back here, right here. So it turns into this container, which is then running out on the Raspberry Pi um, through the web, okay? And that uh, that is done through that guy right there, Fresh RSS which brings up me all my news to my desktop from about five or six different RSS news aggregators. So I don't ever go out looking on the web for my news in the morning. I just pull up my fresh RSS and uh, go through all of my news that I need to see on a daily basis. And if I'm interested in this article right here, I just click on this link, it goes out on the web to the actual article itself. Okay, that's pretty much all I got. Wow, <laughs> that's really <laughs> intense. Cool stuff, Dan. Yeah, well, that's, that's only that's only part of it. I mean, yeah, I have to go, I have, yeah, I have to go I, on for I, hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, this was supposed to be like 10 minutes, but that's all right. No, that's yeah. great. No, uh, for, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so uh, we're, we're kind of getting close to time, uh, but um, Ben, if you want to, do you, do you think you might uh, give us a little quick show or do you want to wait and present another day? Um, we're probably going to have to wait another day. Uh, I'm... Yeah, I would say so. K Kubernetes in general tends to be a little involved especially if you're not used to, the, you know, I mean, you know, if, if you don't use it every day, you you it's one of those things you just have to learn. About. Sorry. I ran over. I, I don't know how much time I took. No, that's okay. No, that's okay. I, I was teasing. That's all. I yeah, was. Okay. <laughs> Kubernetes is one I would definitely want to see though. I'm very interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll well, thank you, Andy. For sure. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Daryl. Really appreciate the three of you. And, and uh, Bobby had to drop off. He had another uh, presentation to give to So, uh, but I uh, really appreciate y'all joining and uh, thanks again. Uh, oh, Bobby, a couple of months ago, I think it was January meeting had, uh, he showed us his uh, Raspberry Pi uh, router. So uh, if, uh, if you're watching this video later um, or if you wanna go right now onto the YouTube channel uh, for the Upstate Carolina Linux users group, um, it should be up there too. So anyway, thank you all so much for, uh, for giving the presentation and uh, Anyone have any questions? I should have asked. Well, just, uh, just to like say to everybody, watch for my link tomorrow to, on the group. I'll post everything I did tonight and the, all the links to all the blog articles and stuff so you don't have to worry. That, that'd that be great. Yeah. Okay. And Andy and Daryl, if you all do the same, and, and uh, I'll, I'll try to put a link in the description of this video too. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for any of the three of our presenters? Well, then hearing none, I thank you all so much, and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jason. See you, Jason. Bye.